I'm the only candidate that wants to get out of Afghanistan tomorrow. In guarding the civil liberties and civil rights lies the essence of liberty. We must not accept these reasons to destroy each other. The real question is how do you prevent a terrorist attack? The hatred continues and, and the violence continues against the Sikhs. Here is a nation of laws and these laws are here to protect everybody. Equal justice. No detention without a trial. So you have the question of morality and legality. And the efforts that you have here now are a tremendous asset. And the more we educate our fellow Americans, the better our society will be. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of American Muslim Alliance. My name is Talat Khan. I'm a family physician by profession. Uh, I'm a national delegate from California. I'm also a California uh, delegate and a delegate for the Central, Central Committee. And all this, I would give emphasis on this, that because of the vision of our Dr. Aga Saeed, um, who has I've been working with for the last 18 years almost, and uh, he has taught me how to get involved uh, in politics, what, which he wants Muslims to have their voices heard. He introduced me to the grassroots level, how the Muslims should get involved and have their voices heard, and also to produce Muslim leadership. And that's where I am. Um, I'm trying my best, whatever I can, to have our voices heard in the system, especially with the Democratic Party, and getting other Muslims involved in that. Uh, the topic today is thought crimes and preemptive prosecutions. Um, we discussed in the last session about religious minorities, including the Sikh community, and Mr. Harpreet Singh gave a very interesting good uh, about the history of uh, the Sikhs in this country and how they were targeted, uh, thinking that they were Muslims. And this session will involve how can we uh, do some precautions about that and also um, uh, how can we work on that together and uh, get, it, uh, get this information uh, to the Democratic Party and how can we work even in the future about that. My first speaker is Mr. Khalil Meek. Uh, Mr. Khalil Meek is a co-founder of the Muslim Legal Fund of America and current executive director. The Muslim Legal Fund of America is a 501c3 charity that supports legal cases impacting civil rights and liberties in America. MLFA is comprised of staff, volunteers, and supporters from all walks of life who have one thing in common, the belief that treating people unfairly because of their religious beliefs undermines the core values that make America great. Mr. Meek also served as the president of the Islamic Association of Louisville Flower Mount from 2001 to 2007, which he co-founded and as president of the Council of American Islamic Relations DFW chapter from 2004 to 2007. Mr. Khalil Meek. First, I want to welcome everybody and thank all of you for taking time to attend this session. Uh, I really believe that uh, this is one of the focal points that uh, the community at large is unaware of. And I'd like to bring that issue to light today with my distinguished guest. Uh, as a representative for the Muslim Legal Fund of America, we want people to understand that what is taking place in today's courtrooms are precedents that have never occurred in the U.S. history before. One of the things that we want to talk about in this session is what's called thought crimes or preemptive prosecutions. Before I begin, I would like to ask the audience if anybody's ever seen a movie, a blockbuster video that came out in Hollywood called Minority Report. Back uh, a few years back, Tom Cruise was the lead, and the premise of the movie was that it's in the future, and law enforcement is so sophisticated that it has computers 
that are able to tell law enforcement where a crime is going to be committed before it happens. So the computer will tell the law enforcement there's going to be a crime in a certain area of the city, and the law enforcement rush to the area, to the scene of the would-be crime. They get there before the crime happens. They arrest the would-be criminal. There's no crime in the future because law enforcement has preemptively stopped all criminal activity. Now, taking that premise and bringing it to today, I need to set a foundation for what's taking place in U.S. courtrooms. How many of you here today think that innocent people should go to jail so that the rest of us can have a false sense of security? How many of you think that's a good idea? Or should nobody go to jail unless they actually commit a crime? Nobody should be punished unless they've actually earned that punishment. To begin this session, and so that our distinguished guests can highlight the examples and really flesh it out, I want to set the legal argument so that you can see from a government's perspective what it's trying to do in a courtroom. And then we'll highlight the issues we have against that, but at least you'll know what they're doing from their perspective. And it starts back in 1996. There was a law that was passed, it's called the, actually it's called the Omnibus Act of 1996. And inside the Omnibus Act contained a statute or uh, a law that is now referred to as the Material Support Statute. How many of you are familiar with the term material support? If I ask you what material support is, what would you tell me? Money? Weapons? Personnel? If I join a terrorist organization? If I give intelligence? If I offer logistics? If I, in a meaningful way, support a terrorist organization? We could consider that obvious examples of material support. I'm for national security. I'm for the safety of this country. I believe that we should have laws, if we're going to have a war on terror, to be able to fight terrorism. But when it comes to this statute that was reaffirmed in the Patriot Act, this material support statute, people who have organizations that function all over the world, and a lot of times in the human rights or humanitarian aid environment, uh, people that work in conflict zones, people that serve humanity, but they now understand that there is a law that says that they can't provide material support, have asked the government for clarity on the work that they do so as not to break the law, but they have no politics. But sometimes they're in environments that the, the countries that they work in are either in conflict zones or one side is favored, one is unfavored. One organization might be involved in a conflict that has a political position against the United States. So in these environments, when people are trying to serve humanity, they have petitioned the government for clarity on what this statute, material support, means. And in their petition, they've given examples of why they asked the question so that the government is clear. And for example, one of the, the things that a humanitarian aid organization might want to know is if I go somewhere like Palestine and I want to serve humanity and I want to feed people that are hungry and poor and needy, and I go to Palestine as an American citizen and I don't even speak the language, and I open up a charity in Palestine and I serve people, I say, if you're hungry, come eat. And I in one day feed 200 people. And the next day I find out that 200 people I fed are associated with a terrorist organization. I fed a terrorist. Is that material support? Another example, if I'm in one of these areas and I need a haircut, I'm still in Palestine, the next day I need to get a haircut. And I go to the barber, I don't speak the language, I point to my hair, he points to the chair, he cuts my hair, he holds up ten fingers, I hand him ten dollars, I leave. The next day I open my newspaper and I see my barber's picture and he's the spokesman for a terrorist organization. I gave him $10. Is that material support? I get tired of guessing. I say, can you tell me who's in charge of this organization? 
They say this guy is. I run to this individual. You, sir, I think are an idiot. I hate what you do. You are causing more harm than good. Every conflict ends in peace. The sooner you get there, the better. Stop what you're doing. Here's some advice. As a Muslim, I give him the advice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or Jesus, peace be upon him. Gandhi, Jimmy Carter, the best roadmap to peace that has ever been written and followed. I say, you're an idiot. Follow this. So I, want to... I gave advice to a terrorist. Is that material support? These questions that have been asked of the government, the government refused to clarify. It wouldn't answer. The issue was brought to a head with a lawsuit. It was called the Humanitarian Law Project. It was led by David Cole, a professor at Georgetown University, a constitutional scholar, who wanted to argue to the court that this definition is too broad. This definition is too vague. It's open to opinion, subjective. We, we need clarity. People that don't have any intention to break the law, have no politics, want to be able to operate. We are asking you to tell us clearly what is and is not material support. And this humanitarian law project went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court came back and refused to clarify it further. It said we're going to allow, in effect, the Department of Justice to use its discretion. And if the Department of Justice thinks that a certain set of circumstance could fit the definition of material support, it thinks that might be what happens, they're allowed to indict. They can go ahead and make the charge and the allegation that this is providing material support, charge you with the crime, take it to court. And they can make that argument to a jury. And if the jury agrees that their theory is correct, then they can convict. You'll find out in court. Now with this framework, this law, the Department of Justice, in its discretion, has been able to prosecute, and I would say persecute, people of interest, people that have ideals, positions that the Department of Justice has deemed a possible threat, that this person may in the future be harmful. They fit a certain profile, they have a certain characteristic, they have a certain demeanor, they provide a certain function, and that with this law of material support and the vagueness it contains, has allowed them to create many theories about conduct of an individual fitting theoretically, potentially, <laughs> into performing an act of material support. So they act as if it's a certainty that their theory is correct, and they bring charges to someone before anything happens. For example, today, if I had a profile of a bank robber, and a, currently, the most sophisticated intelligence tells me that a bank robber is half bald. And he has a blue, and they like to wear blue shirts with white stripes. They carry a cane. They organize events at democratic conventions. And they wear black pants. You, sir, look like a bank robber. It's my recommendation that we proceed as such that you may leave here and go rob a bank. Because you have a car, you fit the profile, we're close to a bank, and you brought your keys. If I can convince a jury that that theory is correct, total legal lawful behavior has now been twisted into criminal activity that doesn't exist. right? We'll talk about some cases today, and, I, and I'm sure they'll highlight this one, but I'm going to give you the punchline. Juries have convicted individuals, and this is their rendering of the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of a conspiracy 
to provide material support to an unknown terrorist organization at an unknown time in an unspecified place. That means you are charged, sentenced, guilty for something that never happened. May have happened, never happened. This issue that we're talking about today, preemptive prosecution, is taking the foundation of this country and spitting on it. Saying that you're innocent until proven guilty, until you actually commit a crime, until you do something unlawful. It's taken it into a realm of witch, witch hunts, McCarthyism, a new boogeyman theory that you look threatening and we're going to act as if it's a certainty. I think it was Dick Cheney who during the Bush administration came out with what he called the 1% uh, uh, the rule. And this 1% rule, as he ordered the Department of Justice and law enforcement, he says if you see people, individuals, organizations out there that have 1% potential threat to the U.S. In other words, you, you see something in that that has 1% chance of being harmful. I want you to act as if it's a certainty. So that means you have a license to go out and act upon that certainty with 1%, doesn't meet a threshold of any legal argument, doesn't meet the threshold of a search warrant, doesn't meet the threshold of any legal navigation, but we're gonna open up all this surveillance, all of this uh, unauthorized search warrants. Uh, we're going to open up the entire Pandora's box and say that you're allowed to proceed with that theory if it means going into a community and and pretending to be with them and to talk about issues and to do entrapment or to do uh, agent provocateur, whatever it takes to create the set of circumstances that confirms our theory and end it before anything ever happens with a conviction or someone going to court. So with that premise, with that framework, I'd like to now allow our distinguished guest to talk about more of the specific issues and how of these are affecting uh, us today in the U.S. courts. Thank you. So now Um, our next speaker is Mr. Stephen Downs. Mr. Stephen Downs is the executive director of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. This organization is a coalition of national and local organizations as well as prominent individuals whose mission is to educate the public about the erosion of civil and political freedoms in the society. Mr. Downs graduated from Cornell, Cornell uh, Law School in 1969 and spent most of his professional career as chief attorney with the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct. Again, the topic today is thought crimes and preemptive prosecutions. Mr. Downs. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. It, it is a great pleasure to be here. And I am greatly indebted to Khalil Meek for his great opening and talk because it, it sets up my comments uh, perfectly here. Um, first of all, I want to just say I'm the, I'm the executive director of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. And this is a coalition of organizations that were formed uh, particularly on three campaigns. Uh, against preemptive prosecution, profiling, and prisoner abuse. And I'm proud to say that AMA is one of our coalition partners, as is International Action Center of Sarah Flounders, and as the Muslim Legal Fund of America and, and Khalil Meek. So all of us are working together on this. Uh, this is such an important issue that it's, uh, it, we need to bring all of our attention to it. 
after 9-11, the FBI, as you know, was directed to prevent another, F, uh, another 9-11 attack. And the problem starts there, although it, it, there is a long history that goes back before that. But the, big, the real question is, how do you prevent a terrorist attack? How do you know when a terrorist is going to strike? You have to be there, and you have to sort of somehow be able to predict it. And because it's, it's such a difficult problem, the FBI decided to focus on certain issues, and one of them is ideology. And I want to emphasize that word ideology. We can say Muslim theology, we can use a lot of things, but I think the word ideology is probably the most accurate here because, as we will see later, it can apply to a large number of other problems. If you look at the idea of, of focusing on ideology, you will see that uh, they will get an idea of what kind of a person might commit the terrorist act if they were a Muslim. And if they were trained by people who are Islamophobic to begin with, they might begin to focus on people who pray too much, who, uh, for example, use language like jihad and paradise within five words of each other. Um, things like this, and you can see how that would uh, cause certain people, completely incorrectly in my view, to say this person could be a problem, there is a 1% chance that this person might turn out to be a terrorist. And from the 1% doctrine, we know that you have to act as though it's a certainty. And those kind of speculations by the government about who might engage in a terrorist attack lead eventually to preemptive prosecution. It is where you go after somebody to try to uh, convict them and incarcerate them before they commit a crime. And there's really, uh, three elements to this. In the first part of this element um, the, is, is the uh, part about the thought crimes uh, coming out of the material support for terrorism laws that Khalil Meek has described. And I don't want to go back into the theory, I think he's described it very well, but I only want to say that his hypothetical cases have in fact occurred. Um, they are, are truly bizarre. Uh, in one case, uh, there was Ziad Yagi, uh, and he took a trip, two trips overseas to visit, visit his relatives in Palestine. Um, at the time, he happened to be vaguely acquainted with a man who had began to gather around him a group of young people and uh, get some firearms together and some other sort of things, and did a little training in the woods. There was no definite plan to do anything, but the government decided that this was all a conspiracy. Zia Jaggi was not involved in any of that. He had simply taken a trip abroad, a perfectly legal act. But the government said, you can infer that when he did this perfectly legal act, it was with the intention of supporting this other group over here that was doing this, this uh, training in the woods for some sort of a vague jihadic plan. Now that's the kind of a pure thought crime that the government is talking about. It's saying, you have to be able to know what other people are doing around you because we can infer from their intent what your intent is. Um, there's another classic case, I think, of, of Barry Bujol. So it's a man who was raised as a, as a, as a Muslim in this country married a Muslim, raised a family, and decided that he wanted to leave the country to go and raise his family in a Middle Eastern land. And the government said, uh, just a minute, uh, before you leave, why are you leaving America to go to a Muslim country? He says, I want to leave, raise my family there. They said, yes, but if you want to raise your family there, is it because you want to hurt America in some way? He says, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I just want to leave the country to raise my family there. And they would not let him do that. And they prevented him from going on the theory that if he left, he might want to do something bad when he got there and, and injure America in some way. Finally, unable to get out of the country, uh, the FBI sent in a, uh, an agent who pretended to be his friend and said, brother, I can smuggle you out on a boat. And he took it as the only way he could get out of America. And then they promptly charged him with trying to fake his way onto a boat so he could get out of America. But this is the kind of, of uh, stunts that they pull. Um, 
and i i to me one of the saddest cases of course is the holy land foundation case you're all probably familiar with that but this is where it was the holy land foundation was the largest muslim charity in america and they raised millions of dollars to do wonderful work all around the world uh and at some point they uh right after 9 11 the u.s government shut down all of these charities just shut them down took the money and uh Holy Land along with it, and then they charged the directors of the Holy Land Foundation with material support for terrorism. And at the trial, the government conceded that none of the money from this charity had ever gone to support terrorism directly. But they said, because you are building schools and hospitals in areas controlled by terrorists, such as Hamas, for example, you added to the prestige of Hamas, and that constitutes material support for terrorism. So, this, of course, virtually eliminates charitable work abroad um, because you don't know when you go out there to do charitable work who you're going to give the money to and how it's going to impact and who it will, prestige it will enhance. Um, and there is, it is done with a certain cynicism, I have to say, because the government only applies that to organizations that they uh, want to, uh, they want to go after. There's a famous case of an organization in Iran, uh, MEG, I mean, uh, anyway, it's a designated terrorist organization, but it happens to terrorize the Iranian government about as much as it terrorizes everybody else. And so there was a group of right-wing people in the United States that wanted to promote this organization and say, wait a minute, why are you listing them as a terrorist organization? They're, you know, the enemy of your friend is, is my friend. Uh, the enemy of your enemy is my friend. Uh, so we should uh, not designate them as a terrorist organization. And so they actually took a lot of money to come. Uh, these were high-ranking officials. Giuliani, I think, was one, and Fran Townsend, and a number of other very high administration officials went out and actually lobbied on behalf of this terrorist organization. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, no, they have never been uh, prosecuted never been prosecuted, even though it is clear that what they did would, violated the law as it should interpreted by the, uh, the Supreme Court. So, uh, you, you add to lack of clarity on the part of the law the fact that it is being unequally applied. One of the other things, the second aspect of this is that um, the government, if they cannot uh, find a thought crime with which to prosecute you, will often assign an agent provocateur to go down and actually try to talk you into it. Uh, one of my favorite stories or, or horror stories of how this is done was the Tariq Shaw case in which the government had some slight inkling from somebody that Tariq Shaw might know how you could pass money on to terrorists abroad and so they asked him if he would do that and he said he didn't know how and he wouldn't do it. And so they assigned an agent provocateur to, prevent, to pretend to be his best friend and see if they could talk him into it. And finally, this agent became so frustrated that he actually went down and set himself on fire in front of the White House to protest what the government was doing. Yes, he actually put himself on fire in front of the White House. He, he wasn't killed, they, they put the fire out, but uh, that's how frustrated this agent was with his own handler. So then the FBI really wanted to get Tariq Shaw, so they assigned another guy. And he went down and he, first of all, tried to take musical lessons from him. Then he moved into his house and lived with him for months with a tape recorder, following him around, take, taping his conversation while trying to talk him into a crime. And finally pieced together enough that he could, they could get a conviction. And he's now spending some 22 years in jail. Um, that's the kind of thing that the government will do. In the Newburgh Four case, they offer, they took a bunch of four young Muslim converts. Two of them had serious mental problems. Uh, one of them was a uh, drug addict, but not all of them, I think, were unemployed or temporarily employed. And essentially offered them $250,000 if they would bomb a synagogue. Well, you could get a you can get an arsonist for much less than that. But that's not what they wanted. What they wanted was a terrorist. They wanted to somebody that they could say, hey, we didn't just buy an arsonist here, we bought real terrorists. And so now these guys are off in jail for a long period of time in what is essentially their attempt to 
shake down the, the confidential informant for money. He was offering the money. They were trying to get the money. He was trying to get a conviction, and he won. So there, there is that aspect to preemptive prosecution. And I finally want to end with one other aspect, which I think is really important. And that is the aspect of solitary confinement. One of the things that the government has been doing is to say, this, these are ideological crimes. And because of that, these people are so serious, they can infect an entire prison. They can infect an entire society. We have to isolate them from the world. And so literally the, the, uh, the day that they are arrested, a lot of them are put into solitary confinement just on the basis of the charge with no other reason to suppose that they will be of any danger. And having been put into solitary confinement, the government can keep them there for years. Sometimes, uh, I think the, the worst case was Mohammed Warsami, who was kept in jail for uh, five and a half years in solitary confinement. Now, we know that after 30 days under our treaty obligations, uh, prisoners have to be let out because the effects of solitary confinement are so debilitating. And after, if you've been at, in solitary confinement for any length of time, uh, you lose the ability to communicate, to testify on your own behalf, you can become paranoid, you can uh, lose the ability to trust your own lawyer. And so in many cases, their, their uh, ability to raise a defense is destroyed. In Warsami's case, he finally, after five and a half years, his lawyer went to the government and said, he is in such pain that he will plead guilty to anything just to get out. And so they said, fine, you know, uh, plead guilty to some charge, and they pled guilty. And within six months, he was out of jail. As long as he hadn't pled guilty, this was one of the most dangerous men in America. He was so dangerous that he, should not, he could not be allowed to talk with anybody. The moment he pled guilty, he wasn't a danger to anybody. They let him out. This is the kind of nonsense that you get from these kind of prosecutions. That was Wasami. Um, I, I could go on. I, as you can see over here, I have this uh, uh, board which I carry around with me that has the name of 155 defendants. Included on there in the pink are a number of peace activists who uh, uh, came afoul of the government because they had the temerity to go over to places like Palestine and Colombia where there were uh, conflicts and try to make peace. And in the process of making peace, of course, they had to talk to both sides. Maybe there was some uh, designated terrorists, organizations on some of the sides, and that would have been enough, according to the government, to be guilty of material support for terrorism, even if you're trying to make peace, even if you're trying to avoid terrorism altogether. Um, so, uh, one of the things the government has done is they have built um, CMUs, communication management units in the Midwest, and in these communication management units, they have locked up what is mostly a Muslim population. These are basically mostly Muslim prisons designed to isolate the prisoners from the rest of the society. Uh, I, I visited there and they are truly uh, brutal, bad places that make it very, very difficult for people to maintain any kind of relationship with the outside world. I had to see my own client through a plate glass window and talk to him on a telephone. And I have to tell you, it was heartbreaking to see his little children on there, sort of fumbling with his telephone, trying to talk to their father through a plate glass, plate glass window. And it, it was just devastating to them. Um, I guess I probably overstepped my time here at this point. <laughs> Nodding. So I thank you very much, uh, and I hope maybe we can talk more on during questions. Mr. Khalil Meek and Mr. St uh, Attorney Stephen Downs for their for their enlightening views. Our next speaker is Ms. Sarah uh, Flounders. Um, she is going to talk about thought crimes and preemptive prosecutions. Ms. Sarah Flounders is a co-director of International Action Center that was founded in 1992 by former U.S. Attorney General. Ramsey Clark as an activist organization opposing U.S. imperialism. The International Action Center is committed to the building of broad-based grassroots coalitions to oppose the U.S. wars abroad 
while at the same time fighting against racism and economic exploitation here in the US. Ms. Flounders is affiliated, is in the board of North Coalition to protect civil freedoms. She's also in uh, working with the United National uh, Anti-War Coalition. She's an editor of 10 books in addition to working with many teams of activists in producing videos and various websites. She was a national organizer in 2002 and 2003 of the huge Washington demonstrations opposing the invasion of Iraq. And in 2010, Ms. Flounders coordinated the emergency mobilization against racism and anti-Muslim bigotry, which resulted in a major outpouring of thousands of people determined to stand for unity and solidarity. She, she has a copy, uh, she has written a book which is called War Without Victory and it is available at the front desk for some money, with a reasonable amount of money. Ms. Flounders. Thank you, and it is an honor to be here. I want to very much thank the American Muslim Alliance Foundation for hosting this meeting, organizing these programs, uh, and particularly to thank Dr. Aga Saeed, who has been engaged for so many years in organizing such forums to, to bring together uh, new thinking and it's, uh, I think, extremely important to be on a program with Khalil Meek and with Steve Downs, who are actively taking on the defense around the country of a whole number of targeted victims of thought crimes. And it's important to think about what are thought crimes. The idea that it is dangerous criminal to think, that threatens everyone here. And it is also based on turning around the very idea about terror and who's responsible for terror and what is terror. Our own government, this government, U.S. government, has bases, a thousand bases around the world and has imposed, through sanctions, the starvation of entire peoples. That's certainly terrorism, to threaten a whole people with starvation, enormous inflation, mass unemployment, total destruction of the environment, we should think about what is terrorism every time a U.S. president says all options are on the table. That's threatening the whole world with nuclear war. That's what all options are on the table means. Everyone knows this. And it is part of the discussion and the terms of debate today. So. This is terrorism, and it can only continue if the whole issue is turned around and we're told that there are anonymous people running among us who are guilty, might be guilty, might be thinking about terror. And for the most part, overwhelmingly, that's not the case at all. And I'm very glad that Steve Downs goes out of his way to give some personal accounts it happens against entire movements. There was a time when every chapter of the Black Panther Party in the US was raided. Black activists rounded up, charged with hundreds of crimes. And some of them, three, je three decades later, still in prison. 
we could look at what happened to the Occupy Wall Street movement this year. Hundreds of completely legal occupations of public space, a park, a city square, no violation of any crime going on. Every one of these occupations were the police came and simply grabbed everyone's belongings, arrested everyone, slapped some charges on. Now, these are people, it's important, young people, not facing 80 years in prison and decades in prison. But it is part of, and really all of the targets, but particularly the Muslim targets, are an effort to create fear and using the charge of terrorism is that effort to say that thought is dangerous. Now, I'm actually not in Charlotte for the Democratic National Convention. I'm here for what's going on outside the Democratic National Convention. And that is that there have been a series of demonstrations and rallies to put forth a people's agenda. That can be a dangerous thing. Those who four years ago challenged the Republican National Convention suddenly had their homes raided and grand jury subpoenas for which they could face still decades in prison. That's criminalizing dissent, something we're told we have a right to, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, along with a right to a trial by jury and knowing your charges and hearing your charges immediately. And so there's a lot that's being thrown out the door because this is right now a country in crisis. There's a global capitalist crisis, we all know it, going on. This is the center of an empire, very much and rather frantically trying to hold together and using more and more fear. Fear and trying to convince the population here that people on the other side of the world are the greatest risk, where the real risk is unemployment, millions of people losing their homes, and the problems are so solvable. I saw at the demonstration and rally called March on Wall Street South. It's a tremendous name because it focuses on the city of Charlotte being the largest financial and corporate and military corporation center in the country after Wall Street largest financial and banking center. Who would have known? Charlotte, North Carolina. But the young activists here know, and they know how it's impacted on them. So, coming together to demand rights, but one of the signs I saw, and it does show how solvable the problems that face us are, it said three and a half million homeless people in the U.S. today. 18 million vacant homes. The, there's five empty vacant homes for every homeless person in the U.S. today. How utterly insane is that? When I say it's a global crisis and a crisis that's greatest here, the contradiction's greatest here, we have the technology of a world so fabulously productive that the crisis is that there's too much and so millions are hungry. The greatest poverty in human history is facing us right now because there's too much of everything and it creates enormous gluts. Now, I'm raising this just to raise also some of the demands being raised outside in the marches and the protests. Many activists from the Occupy movement have taken the park just across the street, Marshall Park. You might go out and visit them, see their tents. 
even though they've been raided in the past, they came here again to put forth their demands and to make sure that there's a people's agenda. And also, and I thought this was important, in the demonstrations, in the protests, in the rallies, to be vocal, to be as visual and vocal and outraged at this direction that the country is absolutely going in more and more and more. The largest prison population in the world is right here in the U.S. today. More people in prison in California than all of Europe, East and West. Isn't that incredible? Uh, that's, that's beyond insane and criminal. There is a criminalization of the youth, along with huge number of deportations and raids and roundups. And seeing this together with the attacks on the Muslim community is important because where we seek allies and how we make connections together is important. Because one thing about targeting different communities is to create isolation. Each community feels that they face an attack that no one else is facing. And that's true. It's unique, the kind of attack that the Muslim community is facing. It's also unique, for example, in New York City, where I'm from, just this year, more than 700,000 stop and frisks of black and Latino youth. Some kids are stopped 5, 10, 15 times. The number of young people who are run through the system face small charges, which means they won't qualify for college loans. It's a dead end, consciously created. So we want to make that part of the agenda too. And we want to make part of the agenda the more than million deportations. The number of families, working parents, who go to work each day not knowing if they'll be able to come home to their children that night. And who make all manner of arrangements about who would pick up their child if they don't come home. That's a form of terror too. It's a whole population who lives under laws that create fear and that are intended to do that. So I'm just raising this because I think it's very important in terms of the agenda here, how we connect things together, and also how we understand U.S. history. Because, and I don't raise this to be pessimistic, I'm actually deeply optimistic because again and again in U.S. history, this effort to criminalize and separate has been pushed back by major struggles. The Civil Rights Movement changed history in the U.S. One writes, there had been complete segregation following slavery, the buying and selling of human beings, and a very powerful movement pushed that back. We could look at the union movement, so much under attack, and especially here in North Carolina, 2% of the workforce here is unionized. And workers who try to organize are routinely fired. That's a form of terror. Your livelihood ripped away from you. Foreclosure, lose your home. That's a form of terror. So we need to expand, I think, and challenge the terminology and the words being used. We need to look at U.S. history and say, along with lofty ideals of democracy and equal rights, it's a country built on slavery. When we say it's a country built on laws, yes, it's a country built on laws. And at one time, slavery was legal. It was a law of the land, the buying and selling of human beings. And to challenge it was illegal. So you have the question of morality and legality. 
And do you challenge the laws when the laws themselves are criminal? And today, many of the laws are criminal. And on the basis of morality, we should challenge them. And we should, rather than embrace the idea of a country built on law, we want to say, we want to be a country built on rights, on the right to speak, and the right to assemble. And why are those important rights? Because when people assemble and speak, they make demands on the right to housing, and the right to education, and the right to health care, the right to a job, the right to equality, the right to live without bigotry. So I'm just uh, putting some of these things in here a little bit um, to, to sharpen the debate, the discussion, and also to challenge the contradictions that exist in this country today, where they say one thing and they do another. And there's a huge break between myth and reality, between saying there's a fight for, to bring justice to the world while bringing war. The largest exporter of arms in the world today is this government. It's the number one U.S. export, weapons. It's the largest part of the federal budget. The overwhelming majority now goes for war. So challenging this and making links, and really, I want to again compliment and say how important the lawyers who are defending those whose rights have been ripped away, whether it's people marching or people praying, we need these lawyers to defend our rights and also to fight to change the laws. I think that's uh, pretty much the points that, that I wanted to uh, make. I wanted to again thank the American Muslim Alliance Foundation for their actions, for their interventions over many years. I very much want to thank also the Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms as an effort to defend and bring new aid and, and to bring the thinking together of a number of legal organizations to challenge no rights a complete change in the political climate of laws, and to say that as in the past, once again, through, through all forms of, of struggle, we can really fight for justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sarah. Um, anybody has any questions um, uh, for the speakers? Uh, before that, let me make an announcement. Congressman Keith Ellison will be here tomorrow, Wednesday, at 2.15 p.m. to address the audience, so please make sure that you are there. Um, a, a question for our attorney? Questions? Uh, yeah, one question. Um, how do we, if any other, uh, some, within the boundaries of our civil rights um, and liberties, uh, any other way we can repeal this NDA? Um, what, what do you suggest? Uh, Dr. Aga Saeed has been working on it, especially with the case of Sami al -Aryan. He has been in there. We know that, you know, with the way he was put in and, so any other suggestions for all the other people? What, what else can we do politically I, and with our congressmen and all that? When I first got involved in this, I had a brilliant idea. It just came to me one day when I was on an airplane reading a report. And buried in the report was a discussion by the Inspector General of the Justice Department on how the Justice Department does not turn over exculpatory evidence. Now, exculpatory evidence is evidence of innocence. In other words, if you as the government receive in evidence indicating that the client is innocent, you are required to turn it over to the other side. And their own inspector general was saying the department simply didn't do that. 
And of course, this is against the law. The law requires to do that. Um, and so, in my naivete, I said to myself, you know, all would be needed would be to have the, uh, the government pass a law, Congress pass a law, saying that the, inspector, the uh, Department of Justice has to turn this over and that there will be enforceable mechanisms to ensure that that happens. And most of these cases would collapse because they're all fake cases. I believe that the government holds in their file a massive amount of information to show that they never believed these were real crimes. Um, what I'm beginning to realize is that that, of course, is, is the naive way of approaching it simply because you cannot easily get Congress to pass anything nowadays, even a bill to adjourn. Um, and so that is only part of the struggle. Uh, what I think Khalid and I and, and all of us and, and Sarah are discovering is that the courts are closed to us, Congress is closed to us, the executive branch is closed to us. They have kind of rallied, you know, circled the wagons and are not um, giving us any opportunity to make the kind of legal arguments that need to be made in this, in this situation. So I have to go with what Sarah was saying, that I mean, we need to build bridges to other, or other groups that are suffering. There are groups all over America that are suffering under this. And each one is suffering in a somewhat different way. Uh, the immigrants are suffering as a result of what the uh, ICE and, and the Naturalization Service are doing. African Americans, you often hear talk about police brutality and about drug cases. The Muslims, you talk about FBI and the preemptive prosecutions. But they all have the same result. The same result is that communities are marginalized and picked on and treated poorly. And that's why this community building is, I think, the, essentially the way that have to go. Thank you. Maria, you had a question? Yeah, I have two things I want to ask. Uh, we know the uh, uh, Obama administration will come, they stuck with the you know, uh, Republican laws and Republican, and they kept it. Now, do you think if the uh, lawyers and the people for civil rights uh, lobbying uh, Obama in the second term, because we know that in the first term the president uh, doesn't want to rock the boat. He start, you know, trying to follow the same thing to be safe. Now, if we, if lawyers start uh, lobbying him, uh, that's one. The second thing is, what about those type of lawyers uh, trying to go into inside the Democratic Party and be active? You know, in in the in the Democratic Party, really to change through the grassroots, because that's the only place where can can the change can happen. Because the grassroots, the activist grassroots, can demand from the the political party to change. So I do. Go ahead. Uh, well, as to the first question um, about whether or not this is possible in the second term, sure, I mean, that's what I hope. I really hope that Obama will open up and become transparent and change his administration <laughs> and do a lot of things. I haven't seen it yet, and I have to just tell you that um, in the beginning, I bombarded him with letters and petitions. I would get letters signed by a thousand people and send it off to him. Same letter. Uh, we have organizations send stuff out. And in none of those cases where I was raising all of these cases here and, the, and all these principles we've been talking about, did I ever get a single response from anybody in the government? Now, I've since signed a lot of other petitions to the White House about all sorts of other silly little things, you know, the, the typical stuff that goes through on the internet. And I always get a response back, you know, the White House feels very strongly about this issue and they're going to fight for you and so on. The fact that you can always get a, an answer from the White House about things that are of normal within the political sphere, but you cannot get any answer for even massive protest letters about things that are really important suggests to me that this is off the table right now. This is not a discussion we're permitted to have with the government. The government is simply not going to respond. They're not going to say, you're right, you're wrong, anything else. They're just not going to respond, which is very unusual for politicians. Typically, politicians want to respond to these things. So it suggests until I start at least getting something from Obama saying, you're an idiot, this is never going to fly, why are you pushing me to do this, that I can't even have a dialogue with him. So I'm going to wait till I get that first, you're an idiot, I can't, you know, why are you pushing me to do this, 
then I'm thinking the door is going to open and maybe we can get somewhere. Right now, I don't see it. Uh, I think it, it is important to recognize that we have, there's two major political parties. They each have a very different social base. The Republicans, absolutely toxic, poisonous message, very bigoted. There's really only the rights of the bankers and the 1%. Democratic Party has a different social base. But really, regardless of who's elected and their aspirations, that the role of the banks and the military corporations, that's what sets the agenda. And if you look at the hopes four years ago and the reality today, we have to take that into account. We have to really think about what it means. Because if we simply think that political participation is pulling a lever on occasion or every few years, we're nowhere. We're nowhere. So it takes a whole different, I think, looking at the problem and even looking at these orchestrated, choreographed conventions that millions and millions of dollars are spent to be a, a candidate for president, for senate, for almost any office now, you have to have multi-millionaire backers. That's a fact. I don't mean for local offices, for smaller offices. But that means that someone with enormous power sets the agenda. And do we live with that constraint or do we find other ways of bringing political pressure now, I also, I just want to make a comment about how to some, fight some of the reaction and challenge it and use an example in New York a couple of years ago uh, of a movement that's still very prevalent today, but we especially heard from it a couple of years ago, the idea that building a simple Islamic center many blocks from the World Trade Center was some enormous crime, threat. A whole population with uh, money put into advertising on the side of buses, on billboards, radio ads, TV, to try to make fear in the population of New York that the building of this Islamic Center was a terrible uh, attack. And at the time, it was announced that 82% of New Yorkers agreed that it would be wrong to even consider building an Islamic center. And, and actually, all across the country, masjids, the building, people found they couldn't get permits. Now, a, a whole number of organizations decided to take this on and challenge it. And because the right wing said they were going to have a demonstration on 9-1-1 on September 11th against the building of this Islamic Center. We said, well, we're, we're going to counter it and counter this climate of Islamophobia. And we're simply going to call for unity and solidarity. Religious freedom, that's guaranteed in the Bill of Rights too. Religious freedom, it's so basic. And yet it was not even part of this debate. And it was incredible. Thousands of people came out. The right wing had said they would far outnumber. They had everything, jumbotrons, they had money, they had advertising, they had politicians speaking for them. But on the day itself, they had a handful of people there with all their equipment and on no budget. A number of grassroots organizations were able to mobilize thousands and thousands of people. And it changed the political climate, claimed the way it was seen. 
why they did a poll just a few weeks after that, and they found that the majority of New Yorkers believe in religious freedom. How about that? Wow. <laughs> you know? So at any rate, I, I just give that as an example that sometimes we can think outside the box and we can consciously build unity and solidarity. Solidarity is a real weapon in the struggle with those who are under attack and call it out and challenge it in the courtroom, but in front of the courtroom. When there's a trial going on, along with the lawyers being there, fill the courtroom, have a protest in front, hold up a sign, put out a press release. That kind of political activity can have a lot of impact. And it also, as Dr. Samuel Arian showed, it can give the defendants the courage to go on. I mean, he is absolutely a hero in showing what is possible to withstand of solitary confinement, of complete abdication of all rights. And he came through that, through fire and, and hell, and is organizing others. So that's just an example, I think, of, of the kind of political activity and the kind of inspiration of a political leader not running for office, but a real leader. Our next question over here. I just had a question for the lawyers. Um, when you mentioned material aid, um, uh, and it was listed to designated terrorist organizations, from what I understand, the African National Congress was at one point declared to be a terrorist organization, as was the Provisional Irish Republican Army. And I wonder, do they have a criteria listed for what, a, what an actual terrorist organization is? Because uh, obviously the Free Syrian Army would, would fit any definition of terrorism that I could imagine. So. Well, what they have are two lists that are public documents, one carried by the State Department and one by the Treasury. That uh, technically list every designated individual and every designated organization and as a public you can refer to that list for your guidance on your behavior until you get to court <laughs> because when you get to court uh, then they'll bring on the State Department and the Treasury Department to tell you how worthless meaningless incompetent those lists really are and that you can't rely on them for just about anything. So uh, I guess uh, uh, if uh, Steve wants to add to that, uh, he can share the legal perspective. Well, they have a definition of terrorism, which if you take it at its most broad and general, it is any uh, attempt through intimidation or violence uh, to, to uh, influence public policy or governmental decision uh, would be the definition of terrorism. I mean, and that in potentially includes uh, all, much of what we consider dis uh, dissent, dissent because uh, there is always a potential for violence if you are protesting something outside of a government building, the police can attack you at any time, and that would presumably be enough to be terrorism. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, they can play with the definition, but as, as Khalid said, the, uh, the, the real problem, I think, is the list, the designated terrorist organization list, because we have uh, any number of cases in which people have been prosecuted, even though they don't have a specific designated terrorist organization, or, or their transactions were not with a designated terrorist organization. But the government says, well, it was associated with a designated terrorist organization, or it was a successor to a designated terrorist organization. So even though it's not on the list, it still counts. So you really are never sure in any event. Uh, and I, I think one of the, the classic cases was Tariq Mahana's case, where he was basically advocating in general that Muslim states should resist all foreign occupation, including US occupation. And that was his general position. And for that, he was convicted on a classic free speech case of designated support for material, uh, designated, material support for designated terrorist organization, even though it was a general statement which didn't include any specific terrorist organization. So I mean, you can see how, how really crazy and difficult this is. One of the principles of criminal law is that you're supposed to be able to know with reasonable certainty what it is that is prescribed. 
And under this law, you really don't until the government tells you what their theory of the case is. To actually get on the list, it takes a legal argument of just cause, which is the lowest threshold, meaning a good reason. Any good reason can get you on the list, just cause. But when they go to court and apply the, the, the law, then the jury has to convict beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? So the jury's threshold is beyond a reasonable doubt. You can get on for just cause. And then when you get to a courtroom and nobody's even on the list, they haven't met the threshold of just cause, the government is arguing for the jury to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. And getting it. And winning. Well, my name is Shabazz Khan. I'm from Missouri. Um, actually, to, to my understanding is the awareness of uh, bringing to the average American. Till we bring that to average American, there will be always homophobia of, you know, terrorists, Muslims, and they will be always looked at terrorists. Uh, I've been to several meetings, they have mentioned everybody. I mean, uh, yesterday I was in a meeting, they were talking about Sikhs. People know Sikhs, people know Buddhists, people, but nobody knows except Muslims being a terrorist. What Islam is, what Muslims are, who we are. I mean, what I read, we are the closest to the Christians. I mean, we believe all the, you know, prophets they believe in. So, to my understanding, till we bring this up front to every average American, who Muslims are, there will be always a threat in their mind that we are haters. We hate Americans, or we hate, you know, the freedom, or we hate uh, Muslims, or we, uh, like 1945, uh, France did not even know the women were humans or not. Actually, I don't really agree with that because I, I think we, in, in saying that, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think we missed the idea that, that these are manufactured cases to suit a particular situation. There is a reason why people are stirring up hatred against various groups. And, for example, I mean, we went to war against the Japanese, and uh, there was so much, uh, people were so upset in this country that it permitted the Japanese to be interned in the camp for, for how many years? But we got over that. Uh, we got over our fear of, or our hatred of various enemies that we fought in the past. And I see no reason why that won't happen again. What I think is the problem right now is that there are various organizations that see an advantage to Americans being afraid of Islam, and so they perpetuate this and push it. I mean, a decade after 9-11, we should be getting over this, and we're not. And it's not, I think, because Americans simply hate Islam because they're ignorant, although there is some of that, but it's because it's, people are, are continuing to feed the fire and throw gasoline on it. And I think that's the real problem. To also comment on this and also uh, respond on a point that uh, Khalil Meek was just making. How do you get a jury to convict when there's no facts at all? And yet, this has happened again and again. That's when you realize the power of the media and the reason it's fed so consciously the criminalization, demonization of Muslims. Then, to be a Muslim, well, it means there's a real possibility you're a terrorist. They've made that equal sign again and again in the media. Why do they want to criminalize Muslims now? Was this going on 30 years ago? A lot of it has to do with U.S. wars now. And if the U.S. wars in the Muslim world were ended, as happened, consider the attacks on the Japanese. At one point, even Japanese features were so characterized, you know, used with caricatures, with used with the ugliest images, 
that it did justify imprisoning the entire, expropriating their businesses, their homes, everything. The entire Japanese American population was put into concentration camps because it was a war with Japan. Today, there is a war, a real war, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, now expanded into Pakistan, the very real possibility of war in Iran, a new war going on right now in Syria. And so how do they justify that to the population here? It's repeated again and again. They're all fighting terrorists somewhere. Weapons of mass destruction. Who, who could have bought that except that the media repeated it endlessly and endlessly? So it is very important to challenge the media stereotypes again and again and to do so with every other organization that has ever fought stereotyping, whether it's union organizations, other religious groups, immigrants, black population here, women's groups. Look for others who in different ways are targeted. And in doing that, you can create new kinds of unity and push back because everyone does understand the ways in which they've been attacked. So identification really will help. But we do have to know this is the power of the media. They create an unconscious element and then they whip it up. A jury goes in for a trial where, quote, terrorists are on trial. And you have to go through metal detectors and countdowns and anyone who's a spectator, they want your license number and, and photo ID and I, I mean really everything but a retina scan. To, just to go into a courtroom. All of that has an impact on the jury. These must be really dangerous people. The jurors can't go out to lunch without going through that, all that again. And that is what creates a predisposition. So the defense lawyers aren't arguing with facts. They're arguing with fears. And that's a really difficult thing because it's subconscious. It's what the jurors don't tell you. And you have the government lawyers saying the facts are irrelevant. Go with your gut. Go with the fear we've created inside you. One of the reasons I love listening to Sarah is that she always provokes something, gets me my mind going. And I just thought, suppose that you went into, you were a juror, and you went into the jury room to decide a terrorism trial, and one of those jurors happened to be Muslim. Do you think it would change the top kind of debate that went on in the jury room? How wonderful it would be to, as a lawyer to have one or two Muslims on that jury who could change the dynamics of how the debate is conducted. Why aren't there more Muslims in the jury room, why aren't there more Muslim judges? And part of the reason is because I think a reluctance of Muslims uh, initially to take part in the political process. A lot of jury rolls are drawn from election rolls. And if you're not registered to vote, you're not going to get onto that jury. And you're not going to eventually get yourself up to be a judge. All of these things are incredibly important. And the Muslim community really has to understand the importance of registering to vote, even if you don't go down and vote, which I don't, I'm not advocating, but simply registering to vote is already something because it can get you on a jury. And every time you can get on a jury, you should try to do it. Another question. Yeah, my name is Ishaq Bateson. I'm from Florida. I've been associated with the American Muslim Alliance for a long, long time. Uh, after hearing the previous uh, uh, session and now, uh, I've been, I'm totally you know, impressed with the knowledge and with the concentration, with what all you're doing. But what brings to, the mind, to my mind is having studied and gone through for so many years, we should 
point out uh, or bring out a solution to every little niche. What should we do to correct the situation? It is very good to continue recording, continue talking about it, but what is the solution? To my mind, from purely from the Islamic point of view, I think Muslims in America, a grassroots effort once again, every home, Muslim American home, they should talk and they should discuss and bring the new generation of politicians in every home. And awareness and, and, and real participation in the political affairs of the country and not just keep saying this is happening and that is happening and there is no question is what are we doing? That is the question. So I would urge the panel to guide us because you have such intense knowledge and uh, you have done so much of work so many years to guide us as to what steps we can take. But we are ready to receive and implement those things to bring out better results. Maybe we can make this our closing statement. Yeah. Um, I think that the best advice, in other words, what can we do as individuals? Because we're all looking for a solution, and we have a solution in AMA, we have a solution in the, the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, and the Project Salam, and the Muslim Legal Fund. We have organizations that are doing the work, but their biggest hurdle is funding, and their biggest hurdle is resources. And so everybody that listens can support organizations that are doing the work. Because if they don't get the support, then you have to reinvent the wheel over and over and over and over again, and you never get anywhere. But beyond that big thing, because that becomes a collective effort, and I, it's too big for me, I can't do it, so then therefore that's my out, I do nothing. I encourage all of us to take what we learn and apply it to our circle of influence. If you've learned anything today, and you know somebody other than the people here, then you need to tell them what happened and, and re, for, re, regurgitate what we've talked about so that you're spreading that knowledge and that information. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll end with just an analogy. Because everybody, in my opinion, looks for an out to say that, well, that's too big for me. I can't do it, but I'm ready to support the one who can and with a story of a little boy walking on the beach with his father after a huge storm. And the storm brought in the, um, what do they call it? Sea turtle. No, well, it brought in, uh, no, no, just what's it called when it comes to the beach? Uh, yeah, the waves, uh, the tide. Yeah, the, it brought the tide in so big and so deep that when it receded, it left the entire beach just littered with starfish. Hundreds of thousands of starfish are sitting on a beach because they were brought in by the waves. And they all try to get back to the water, but there's too many. It's too far now. And it's going to be a natural disaster. The starfish are going to dry out and die. And the boy and the father are walking on the beach and they see this before them. And the little boy, he stops every two feet. He'll reach down, he'll pick up a starfish as hard as he can, he'll throw it into the ocean. And his father is watching his son and he wants to console him. He says, it's okay, son. It's going to be all right. God must have intended this. This is huge. You can't possibly get all these starfish back in the water. The little boy's looking at his dad. He'll walk a few more feet. Then he'll stop again. He'll reach down. He'll pick up a starfish and he'll throw it in the water. And his dad sees that he's not getting over this. It's affecting him. And he's trying to console him. And he says, son, it's not going to make a difference. Look at what we're doing here. It's okay. And the little boy looks at his dad again. And he looks at the starfish. And he reached down again and he picked up a starfish. And he threw it in the water. And he goes, Dad, I made a difference for that one.
So if you can't solve the whole problem, if you can't fix the whole thing, do what you can do. Okay, I, I can just make my, my last statement is that I, I find everywhere I go, people come up afterwards and they said, we had no idea. Nobody told us, we didn't know this. And the one thing you can be sure about is the government is not gonna tell you, nor is the media. So it's really up to us to, to get this information out. Uh, and I've been going around all over the country, I just simply responding to people who have heard what, what we've said and say, can you come here and talk to us? But we can't cover it all either. So just like Khalil says, um, it's really up to you to spread the information, get it out there. And if there's one other thing I would recommend doing, it would be if we could get every mosque to just tell the people, look, someday we're, gonna, we're all gonna be Baptists. Baptist church, they bring a bus up, they load everybody up and they go down to vote. They go down to register and then they go down to vote and everybody gets on the bus. And that's how you start to exert political influence because I, I've worked on political campaigns, I know how it works. You go down the list of potential voters in your district and you say, oh, there's a bunch of people here but they never vote. We don't have to worry about them. I've actually heard the politicians say, we don't have to worry about them, they never vote. If you just went out and voted, suddenly people were going, oh, these people vote, we've got to worry about them. Let's find out who they are and what they want. That's how you get into the process. So I would really, I would urge, urge them, the Muslim community to take an example from the Baptists, because I think they've got a fabulous organizing for, for political issues. Well, I'll take that just another step, because the voting only comes every few years. So it's what you do in the meantime and at other times that's also very important. So if I were asked about solutions, I'd say the first thing is it's important to know what you're up against, to know you're not alone, to know it's important to build networks and support those who are already fighting and resisting and struggling. And also to know that the corporate media has a role. The military corporations are the largest owners of media today in the US. Part of their role is to make us believe we're irrelevant, powerless, to marginalize any real movements for change. There's also a vast alternative media today that's part of political action. It's why videoing today's meeting is important. It reaches a far larger audience than those sitting here. All the programs that the American Muslim Alliance puts on, am I right, get aired pretty widely. Lots of people watch it. So we're speaking to the people here today, but we're also speaking to people who get their information all kinds of ways today. And it's why we should take every avenue as a serious discussion. I, I'm directing that actually right here because we have to think where our voices are the strongest. You know, you speak to young people today, they call an action, put a hashtag on it, they get it out by Twitter and you know, it, it's, it goes viral, as they say. Uh, it's not even just on a web link. They live stream it. Uh, so, and that kind of media actually reaches the people who are most actively involved in change. So we can either be pessimistic or we can look consciously for who's involved in change and how to reach out to them. And there are a lot of ways to do it in the world today. The world of corporate power is declining and is no longer able to organize the globe. The days of colonialism and neo-colonialism are past. So I think we should take confidence in new ways, new currents, new ideas, and know that the repression we face is, is an old order trying to hold on, but change always breaks through. 
Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers um, for giving us the vision. It was very interesting and for all the help you are giving us uh, and the guidance. Thank you very much. If you are interested in watching more civic education videos, please visit our websites.